for this. We have seven lightning round talks about to begin. I'd like to first uh, introduce our moderator, Isabella De Francesco, who is our communicating uh, communications and marketing specialist for the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance uh, and among other hats that she wears. Um, so, Isabella. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. So, these are the lightning talks. They are rapid fire presentations by emerging scientists. This is going to go really quickly, so definitely pay attention. Okay, hello, um, my name is Amanda Bevins, and I am a graduate student at Morgan State University's Patuxent Environmental and Aquatic Research Laboratory, or PEARL. Um, in partnership with NOAA, PEARL is exploring the economic effects of oyster restoration in seagrass habitat in Virginia's Middle Peninsula through the de development of two ecosystem models. NOAA has recently selected Virginia's Middle Peninsula as a new habitat focus area. Our project focuses on two Chesapeake Bay tributaries within the Middle Peninsula, the York and Pankatank rivers. Two important living habitats, oyster reef and seagrass, are changing in both systems and in response, commercially valuable fisheries associated with these habitats could also change. To better understand this relationship, the project will develop ecosystem models for both rivers, interview watermen to outline annual expenditures, and apply harvest and revenue outputs to an economic model that projects possible <laughs> local impacts related to habitat change. An ecosystem model characterizes the trophic structure of an ecosystem. Environmental variables and fisheries harvest are accounted for in the models as well. And this type of modeling can be used to capture the effects of change in a system. The models are meant to incorporate species that interact in a system. Species of interest include commercial species, um, species important to trophic interactions, and species associated with living habitats. Ecopath with Ecosim will be utilized to create these models, which will be developed using the latest years of available data. Ecopath produces a static snapshot of a system using a food web. Ecosim, a time dynamic module, will then run simulations for 20 plus years, projecting the effects of habitat change over time. The models will run different scenarios based on differing degrees of oyster and seagrass restoration. Outputs will summarize commercial landings and revenue. These outputs will then be used in the economic model in plan, which translates the results to local jobs and dollars. In closing, the ecosystem models developed under this project will characterize two ecosystems in Virginia's Middle Peninsula using EcoPath. An ecosystem will simulate change to both oyster and seagrass habitat separately and together over time. Harvest and revenue results for both models will be applied to the economic impact model in plan, which again translates the ecosystem model outputs to local jobs and dollars. Overall, this project will evaluate the regional and economic effects um, of the change to foundational habitats in two Chesapeake Bay tributaries in Virginia. Thanks for listening. Um, again, my name is Amanda Bevins, and feel free to email any questions to my email in the slide. Thank you. And I'm Cecilia speaking on utilizing natural chemical and physical properties in restoration. So feel free to take it over. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Cecilia Monaghan. I am the Chesapeake Oyster Alliance intern. Uh, and today I'll be presenting my research on utilizing the natural chemical and physical properties of oyster reefs and restoration design. Um, the basis of my research has focused on creating an all-natural mortar using shell bond, a powdered calcium carbonate product made from made by superheating shell and bone and dousing with water. Uh, by combining with menhaden oil, sand, and seawater, you can create a strong all-natural mortar that closely resembles the makeup of an oyster shell. Due to its non-polar properties, the shell bond forms a covalent bond with the menhaden oil and combined with seawater and sand to maintain consistency, it creates a natural mortar that rates as type S in terms of strength without using concrete binders. The makeup of this mortar has several benefits, including acting as an ideal surface for oyster reproduction and raising water pH from the use of shell bond, 
Um, it increases ambient fish biomass and phytoplankton levels uh, from the use of menhaden oils, which is a fish oil, um, and helping to prevent toxic algal blooms through the promotion of oyster growth and filtration. Another benefit of this mortar is the ability to manipulate its shape to address substrate limitations, increase surface area, and implement physical methods to increase survivability and ecosystem benefits. By using this mortar as a coating layer on other materials, we can make limited substrate cover a larger surface area, as increased surface area allows for more oyster recruitment. My personal favorite feature of this mortar is that all of its component, components are naturally found in coastal ecosystems, so we're not introducing foreign substances. Um, using this mortar, we're able to implement methods that mimic natural oyster reef structures and benefits. On the right, I have an example of utilizing those physical properties in an educational sculpture design. My work, I prefer, I use art to help promote or have it act as an educational tool to improve understanding and engagement. Um, but it's also a great way to implement those structures. Um, one of the ways is the microhabitat formed by the little divots in the sculpture help to increase the oyster survivability by providing protection from wave action and increased anchoring surface for the oyster. The angle of the wrist is designed to allow waterfowl such as uh, herons and egrets to use as hunting grounds. And the grass, under, the grass design underneath is meant to mimic mangrove roots for better anchoring and also to create a space for fish to lay their eggs and protect themselves from larger predators. Um, this together allows us to create uh, restoration designs that mimic the chemical and physical structures of natural reefs and restore in a more efficient manner. Thank you. Thank you so much, Cecilia. Awesome, thank you, sorry. <laughs> All right, so hi everyone, I'm Julia and I'm a grad student um, at VIMS working with Bill Walton. And today I'll be presenting on how stocking density and biofouling control uh, impacts water parameters inside floating bags and baskets. Uh, so in the early 2010s, farmers in the Chesapeake Bay region began reporting mortalities of 30% in one-year-old oysters approaching market size. And that number skyrocketed in 2014 to 85%. And these mortalities spread to include growers uh, throughout the entire East Coast. Uh, so notably parasitic diseases such as MSX and dermo and harmful algal blooms could not explain these mortalities. And in many cases, ambient water conditions appeared suitable for, for oyster growth. Uh, so what could be happening? Qualitative observations at farms suggest that a number of factors vary um, among and even within farms in terms of the conditions within these grow out bags. So the nature of mesh bags and baskets produces microenvironments susceptible to decreased water exchange rates, and this can be magnified by decisions that farmers make, uh, such as biofouling control, stocking density, and, and ploidy. So if you look at these pictures, so the picture on the far left, it's a bag within a cage, and it's just a wall of biofouling, um, and that's compared to the middle picture, which it's a clean mesh bag, and you can see the oysters through the bag, and these are just artifacts of decisions that producers make on their farm. Um, so keeping this, these differences in mind, um, we asked the question of, do biofouling control and oyster stocking density uh, decisions affect the microclimate inside grow out bags? So we're, we have a three by two study in which we're testing three different stocking densities, high, normal, and empty against air dried versus not air dried treatments. So that gives us six uh, different treatment groups. Um, so we deployed an experiment at a local at a local oyster farm who has experienced one of these mortality events. And um, I use a kayak and I pull up to my bags and uh, I use that so as not to disturb the water parameters within these bags. And I pump out about 250 milliliters worth of water and I use a YSI to assess the parameters in real time. Parameters meaning dissolved oxygen, pH, chlorophyll A, and turbidity. Um, so ongoing sampling indicates that there are statistical differences among my treatment groups for each of the parameters measured. And in a sampling event on September 19th, which occurred two days before a split. So a split meaning that we just decreased the density of oysters within each of the bags. Um, we found that stocking density is significantly really related um, to dissolved oxygen, whereas DO is lower in stocked bags, regardless of density, as compared to empty bags. Um, and then pH, chlorophyll A, and turbidity, there's an interaction between stocking density and biofouling control, um, in which pH is lower in stocked bags than empty bags, 
uh, along with chlorophyll and turbidity, they're also lower in stocked bags than empty bags, with the exception of the highly stocked non-air dried bags are not significantly different from the empty treatment groups. Um, so results from this ongoing study suggest that farmers can influence the water parameters within their floating bags through husbandry decisions, and this could correlate to oyster performance. And we hope to provide producers with better data so farmers can make more informed husbandry decisions while also uh, maybe identifying factors driving these mortality events. Uh, thank you. Christina, you have to unmute yourself. Uh, we couldn't hear anything going on, so I'm sorry. Um, I did not realize it was time for me. Uh, okay. Are we ready? Yes. Yes, we are. <laughs> um, so my name is Christina Rarick, and I'm also a grad student at VIMS working with Mark Brush. Um, this project, funded by the Elizabeth River Project, quantifies the ecosystem services as related to improving water quality and mandated load reductions under the Chesapeake Bay total maximum daily load. Um, so a hybrid empirical mechanistic ecosystem model with oyster submodel was applied to the Lafayette River, being the first fully restored tributary in Virginia. Um, parameters outside of that blue box. Um, such as salinity temperature and initial TSS are forced into the model using available data, while parameters and stocks inside the model are calculated using metabolic and mechanistic equations. Uh, the Lafayette River and watershed were divided into seven boxes for inputs and hydrologic exchange of parameters such as nutrients and chlorophyll A throughout the river. The impacts of oysters were simulated at the lower restoration target of 15 oysters per meter squared, the upper restoration target of 50 oysters per meter squared, and the upper observed density um, in the river of 100 oysters per meter squared. And percent water filtration and percent removal of chlorophyll A and TSS all follow these seasonal patterns with late summer peaks. Um, 50 oysters per meter squared has roughly a three times greater impact than 50 oysters per meter squared, while 100 oysters per meter squared has roughly a one and a half times greater impact than 50 oysters per meter squared. And annually, reefs with 100 oysters per meter squared can filter about 13% of total river volume and remove about 8% of particulate stocks. Denitrification is the greatest source of nitrogen removal, followed by uptake into shell and tissue with the least nitrogen removed through burial. And once again, it follows the same uh, ratio with 50 oysters per meter squared having three times of greater impact than 15 and 100 oysters per meter squared having about one and a half times greater impact than 50. Annual phosphorus removed followed a similar trend to annual nitrogen removal, excluding denitrification. And restored reefs were predicted to remove um, around 7% of total inputs. So when oysters reach high density, their restoration can be an effective supplement to the other nutrient management efforts. And plan future additions to this model to better simulate the impacts of variables like pH, chlorophyll A, and O2. Um, will more readily allow for modeling the impacts of multiple stressors on the oysters, including ocean acidification um, on the restoration effects. The end. <laughs> All right, next up, we have an investigation of the solar oyster production system by Daryl Acker Carter from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Gerald, can you unmute yourself, please? There we go. Hi, everybody. My name is Daryl Acker yep. Carter. Good to go. Yep. Okay. Hi, everybody. My name is Daryl Acker Carter. I'm a master's student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County. And today I have the pleasure of talking to you about a new technology for oyster restoration, the Solo Oyster Production System, or SOX. SOX is a unique aquaculture system that raises oysters vertically throughout a water column on a Ferris wheel type system. 
And being such a unique system, you can imagine there not being a lot of research on how oysters might grow in a vertical rotating structure. This study seeks to provide insight on how oysters grow in the system. Some of the key objectives we are focusing on is to identify the effect of daily rotation on oyster growth, shell shape, condition, survival, and biofouling. Ultimately, we want to observe how oysters grown on shops compares to traditional rearing methods. In the case of this study, we are looking at the methods used by the Chesapeake Bay Foundation's oyster gardening program. In each of three operational ladders on stock, we stocked uh, 28 baskets of fat on shell oysters and two of the three ladders rotate one position every 12 minutes. Additionally, we have five cages from the CBS Oyster Gardening Program on the anterior side of SOPS. Um, we sample oysters for height every three weeks on, along with collecting data on survival and photos of the cages to analyze biofouling. For the sake of this presentation, I would like to focus on how oysters grow specifically on SOPS. And for our preliminary results, we observed positive growth across all three ladders. Um, however, when we performed our NOVA, we did not detect a significant difference between the ladders, which for us is super interesting as we didn't originally predict, we did originally predict that there were gonna be a difference. Um, but speaking anecdotally, we are seeing some differences with biofiling, however. You can see in the bottom left-hand corner, uh, biofiling images from the static ladder, the CBF cage, and the rotating ladder. What I've shown you here today is just a small piece of the full story behind SOPS. Data collection will finish up in a few weeks, and we're going to start looking at the condition of the oyster, as well as analyzing that biofiling data to complete the full story. I hope you've gotten, uh, I've gotten your interest in this technology, and I hope you'll follow along as the story continues. Thank you so much. Thank you, Daryl. Next up, we have Jessica Diaz from the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, presenting on an investigation of oyster growth and survival in the Baltimore Harbor. Jessica, you can unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. My name is Jessica Diaz, and I'm a master's student through the iCare program at UMBC. And so the goal of my project in investigating oyster growth and survival in the harbor is to really assess current and potential um, restoration initiatives. So I'm looking at one, how does oyster growth and survival vary? Two, does water quality have an influence? And three, what is food availability and quality like for oysters? So if we look at the map, we can see the two sites um, on the top right in that inner harbor area in the green and in the yellow, that's Downtown Sailing Center and Lighthouse Point. And CBF in partnership with the um, Waterfront Partnership of Baltimore currently hosts oyster gardening there where for six months, volunteers come out and take care of the cages, clean them, do all those things. And then those are, um, those, those oysters go to the Fort Carroll Reef. And so I also have two other sites. One is um, down at the bottom, Map C, which is where Daryl does his research. And the other is in the purple, the Middle Branch Marina. And so all of these sites, I deployed oyster hanging cages um, from April through September. I took oyster height and survival, as well as water, um, water samples to get phytoplankton environmental DNA for that food availability piece. And I also took water quality measures. And so if we look in the bottom left, we can see two figures, the first one showing how oysters are growing at these four sites. And we see that the two solid lines for Downtown Sailing Center and Lighthouse Point East, oysters there seem to be growing relatively um, consistently. And at MAPSI, they seem to just kind of be a little bit all over the place, which is pretty interesting. And then we have Middle Branch Marina, which um, is consistently below the other three sites. Um, but overall, oysters are growing, and that's really exciting be because often the Baltimore Harbor is just written off, and a lot of people think that oysters can't grow there or that other things can't grow there. And so we're demonstrating that they actually can grow there. And so then we have the water quality measures of temperature, salinity, and dissolved oxygen. And the big thing to note here is that the four sites are all pretty tight. And so this suggests that it might not be these water quality measures that are really explaining the variance that we see between sites. 
And so I'm really excited to dive into that third question of what is food availability and quality, um, just to see how is the phytoplankton community changing at the different sites and if that has any effect on what we're seeing at oyster growth. And again, these are preliminary results, um, but yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jessica. And for our final presenter, we're going to return back to our first presenter, Elizabeth Weathera, presenting on oyster mortality and parasite prevalence in the York River. So Elizabeth, feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, everyone. Glad you can hear me now. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm just wait for the it's loaded. All right, there we go. Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Weatherup and I'm a master's student at VIMS in the Aquatic Health Science Department. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about how oysters are responding to intense Perkinsis marinus disease pressures. So when we hear Perkinsis marinus or dermo, we automatically associate this parasite with mass mortality of oysters and a very big problem. And that was true in the past. It did cause a lot of mortality outbreaks and was very problematic. But what I wanted to know is what it, were the current interactions between the intensity of this parasite and oyster mortality out on the York River. So by collecting oysters out on the York River from 1989 to now, we've been able to estimate oyster mortality using box counts and dermo intensity using raised fluid thioglycolate medium. So that's actually one of my pictures on the right with those black circles. Those are actually enlarged hypnospores of Perkinsis marinus. And so by looking at these in oyster tissues, we can quantify how intense the Perkinsis infection is in our oysters that we collect. So on my graph to the left, the black line is showing oyster mortality and the bars are showing the dermo intensity score. So we can visually see oyster mortality steadily decreasing over time, but this dermo intensity is still remaining high and pretty consistent throughout all the years. And unfortunately, I don't have the time today to show you my linear regression models, but they do align really well with this figure and suggest that the relationship between oyster mortality and intensity in dermo was much more significant in past years compared to what I did in part of my thesis study in 2021. So much so, whereas a one-fold increase in past years of dermo intensity would cause like 73% mortality, percent more mortality, whereas in 2021, this increase only increased mortality by like 2%. So very significant findings there, which was really cool. And with this information, it does appear that oysters have developed tolerance to this disease as it is able to reduce the effects of infection on its fitness, regardless of how intense this parasite infection is. Um, so this is really cool. Um, I'm very excited about the start of this project and looking at all my results and everything because the word dermo has always been dreaded in aquaculture industries, but these results really highlight that oysters are readily able to adapt to this challenge over time. And this will be really useful information to guide um, aquaculture management in the future. And if you would like to contact me to talk more about this project, to hear about more results, feel free to contact me. And a special thank you to the VEMS Foundation, A. Marshall, A. Cuff Memorial Endowment for Oyster Disease Research for funding on this project. Thank you guys. everyone um thank you for the science